Welcome to Sherlock Mondays, everyone. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and we're going on a biblioventure through the stories of Sherlock Holmes. And joining me for our very first episode is my friend, Dr. Anastasia Klimchinskaya. Hi, Anastasia. Oh, you're muted, so. Three years of pandemic and I still forget to unmute myself. Hi, Ed, it's, it's really great to be back. I am so happy to have you back. I mean, people, this, people who watch Biblia Adventures before will know that Anastasia was a co-host on Sundays of Frankenstein, and I couldn't think of a better person to have on Sherlock. When I give you her longer introduction later, you'll know why. Um, do you like the new opening credits, Anastasia? I do. I love them. I, I'm always, I feel so special when we get the opening credits. I feel like a star. And the song too, right? So that's a yeah. pleated gazelle song. Uh, Tucker Christine, who who records and writes music as pleated gazelle, has done all the themes for all the Biblia ventures, and each one is is absolutely fantastic. So thank you, Tucker, for the music. And it was Scott Banks who did the artwork, the, our great logo for the show, and he also created the credit sequence for us. So thank you, Scott. Well, everyone, for thirty weeks. We're talking about Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes adventures. Uh, each week, we will deduce, decipher, dissect Doyle's stories about the world's first consulting detective, Sherlock Holmes, and his able assistant, Dr. John Watson. It will be a kind of conversational annotation. The Rosamack holds in its collection first editions of Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes book, as well as the handwritten, handwritten manuscript of The Adventure of the Empty House. Our founder, Dr. Rosenbach, was deeply committed to mystery and crime literature. He corresponded with the famous Sherlockian and founder of the Baker Street Irregulars, Christopher Morley. I think he could you could say they were friends as well. Uh, and Dr. Rosenbach once purchased Conan Doyle's personal crime library, and then, you know, sold it, of course. Um, unfortunately, we don't have it anymore uh, because Dr. Rosenbach was a book dealer as well as a collector. Um, a reminder, everyone, if you're watching live right now, uh, thanks for watching and tuning in live. Um, uh, I would uh, recommend you uh, please like and subscribe uh, to this uh, video and uh, have fun in the live chat. The live chat is for you guys to have fun talking to each other. Uh, if you're watching the recording, please like and subscribe. And I'd love for you to leave comments or questions in the comment field below the video. Uh, this show will also have an audio podcast, which will drop a few days after this video live stream. Uh, you can look for that everywhere you get podcasts. And if you're listening to the podcast version, welcome and thanks for tuning in. Uh, I would ask you all to please consider making a donation to the Rosenbach or by becoming a member, you can do this at our website, rosenbach.org. Your support helps us create programs like this and care for our collections. Sherlock Mondays is brought to you by the generous support of Lisa Washington. Thank you, Lisa. So let me introduce my first co-host for Sherlock Mondays. Dr. Anastasia Klimchinskaya is a scholar of 19th century literature with a deep interest in the intersections between science, technology, literature, and the cultural imagination. Having called Philadelphia home while receiving her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, she has previously appeared on the Rosenbach Sundays with Frankenstein and written widely on Sherlock Holmes, science fiction, the history of science, and the Gothic in numerous scholarly and Sherlockian publications. She is, of course, a member of the Baker Street Irregulars, the world's oldest and most renowned Sherlock Holmes Society, and she also helps organize PhilCon, which is Philadelphia's science fiction convention. I think the oldest science fiction convention. Am I, am I right about that? It, it is, yes. And it is one that Isaac Asimov, who is also a Sherlockian and a BSI member, actually attended um, when he lived briefly in Philadelphia. A few people know that, but there's a plaque somewhere in West Philly. Yeah. Yeah, Heinlein lived here during World War II. <laughs> so there's a lot of great sci-fi connections to Philadelphia. As Absolutely, well. yeah. And a lot of great writers still in Philadelphia who write science fiction. Um, Anastasia, what is your Sherlockian story? How did you first get? Oh into boy! Sherlock well, stuff? I hope I hope you have a couple hours. That no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, we do, and we're going to run long tonight, everybody. It's the first episode and the first story. We're definitely going to run long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, 
let me backtrack a little and say that, as you can probably tell from my last name, I am not from around here. I was actually born in Belarus, technically in the former Soviet Union. Um, and back there, uh, Sherlock Holmes was incredibly popular. It's what everybody read growing up. You know, Sherlock Holmes, The Three Musketeers, Charles Dickens, those were kind of the classics. Um, and so when I was learning English, my mother decided, well, you know, you've had enough of Nancy Drew, you need to read something more serious now, but you like mysteries. So she, here's Sherlock Holmes. And she gave me The Adventures and the Memoirs, which is what she had read growing up. And so I read The Adventures and then The Memoirs and 130 year old spoiler alert he dies at the end of you know the memoirs he and Moriarty go off the cliff whatever um and so I thought that was that because my mother thought that was that that was only as far as she had read she was just sort of like well this is what happens is it isn't it sad this great tragedy that, that this great man died of course uh what I didn't know is that 10 years later Arthur Conan Doyle resurrected Sherlock Holmes um you know there's debates as to why whether he needed money or you know we can get into that but um 10 years later he brought Sherlock Holmes back he wrote more stories but I didn't know that for a whole 10 years until BBC Sherlock came out Robert Downey Jr.'s movies came out Sherlock Holmes kind of got extra popular in the cultural imagination and I went back and realized there were more stories than he didn't actually die and Moriarty didn't kill him and actually he solved a bunch sure. more mysteries and uh retired to to keep bees on the Sussex down so uh exciting um but that that was also when I got sort of into Sherlockian societies, I started investigating more. I learned about Sherlock Holmes societies, and I was actually an undergraduate um, at the University of Chicago back then, and I actually live in Chicago now. And I remember this was back before all the Sherlockian societies had social media and were very visible. And I remember kind of emailing one of them. I found some like list somewhere and saying can I can I come to the meeting and the society I had emailed was like one of the most exclusive by invitation only societies in the in the entire country and so they sort of said why don't you try this other one first and kind of build up your pedigree huh. and so that was almost like a gateway drug of, um, from which I started attending meetings I started uh, writing articles for the Baker Street Journal. I started going to the BSI weekend. I started sort of getting involved in the community and here I am. What was your first article for the BSI do you, or for the Baker Street Journal? Do you remember? Mm, yeah. So it actually won the Morley Montgomery for the best article in the journal. And I remember the editor, Steve Morley, calls me up and he's sort of like, so there's this. Steve there's Rodman. This, you said Steve Morley, which I'm oh. sure Steve would be happy to be called giving Christopher Morley, right? Call him Steve Morley. I love that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Steve Rothman, he calls me and he's sort of like, there's this award for the best article in the Baker Street Journal and you won it. And I remember going, really? As if he had just sort of called me to prank me or something. And he's like, no, really? So you need to come to the Baker Street weekend in New York so you could like accept the award. Because if you're not there, it'll be uncomfortable and awkward. Um, but yeah, it was, um, this article that takes a line from chapter one of study in Scarlet, which we're talking about today, which, um, it's a quote from Alexander Pope's, the proper study of mankind is man. And I remember it was this lengthy article making the claim how, uh, Sherlock Holmes really was a student of human nature, um, in the way that. Alexander Pope in that essay of man had sort of articulated the idea that you shouldn't look up above and try to understand God because you're not going to. You should focus on studying mankind, which is what you can understand. Very cool. And you won the award. You're awesome. That's great. I, I first did. One too. Like other, other people write for BSJ are like, what? We won the first one? Your first try? So, but you are a great scholar, writer, 
thinker. Thank you. Well, it it prevented me from submitting for the longest time, submitting again, because if you win with your first article when you're like 19, that's a really high bar. And so <laughs> hard to live up to but your Mary, own. You know, Mary Shai writing Frankenstein. And then it's like, well, you did that. Now you got to top it. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, what everyone can expect from this show is that like our previous uh, Biblio Ventures, Sundays with Dracula, Sundays with Frankenstein, Sundays with Jane Eyre, and Austin Mondays, Pride and Prejudice, which are all available on the Rosenbach's YouTube channel if you're new. Every episode, Anastasia or three others, Curtis Armstrong, Monica Schmidt, and Mary Caro, they'll all rotate throughout the show, and they would join me for a conversational annotation of one of the Sherlock Holmes tales. And we're going to proceed in the order that they were published, starting with The Study in Scarlet. And we're going to stop at the adventure of the empty house. And since the first two Sherlock tales are novellas, Study in Scarlet and Sign of Four, we're going to give them two episodes each. Uh, I need like two episodes for just the first half here tonight, but we'll squeeze it in in one episode for the first half. Um, it, then each story will be just one episode, uh, roughly 90 minutes long per episode. Although, again, tonight will definitely go long. But wait. There's more. Um, once per month, we will have a special Sherlockian guest, and we'll spend an extra 30 minutes with that guest talking about a Sherlockian topic. And our first special guest will be Leslie Klinger, who will join us on episode three to talk about the annotated editions of Sherlock Holmes. So, and the perfect person for that, who's got the biggest annotated edition out there now, the, the like dean of annotated editions. He does so many of them, but he's going to talk all about annotated editions, what they're about, how to use them, their history, all of that. So that'll be fun. Stay tuned to Midbreak today. And I will tell you about an exclusive pay only limited series on the Hound of the Baskervilles. Same format, same hosts, same time, Mondays, but in May and June 2024 after this show ends. We will also have specialty cocktails for each show. Our Sherlock Tales, created by one of our co-hosts, Mary Alcaro, who will join me on a later episode. Mary has come up with a fantastic Sherlock Tale to kick things off. It is the Scarlet Scheme, which you see I've put in my Sundays with Frankenstein mug with Anastasia right here on the mug. So I'm drinking out of a glass with, with your with your face on it um well um if if we're sharing mugs i do have to say i'm i'm drinking out of a cup with my name on it in a way too this is actually <laughs> um you can't see it says the old russian woman which is my investiture into the bsi it's sort of a quote from the cheryl Holmes stories that you're given when you're invested into the baker street irregulars and well this is actually a gift from monica who will be on the show and i think two or three weeks so oh, thank you monica cheers all these little you know connections we have here well everyone yeah. you can find this recipe in the youtube description for the episode and i also send out the recipe via email every week for those who are registered for the show you can register at the sherlock mondays homepage on rosenbach.org before we talk about the story uh, I'm going to give a little intro at the publication and a little intro, Arthur Conan Doyle, kind of, you know, him coming to write this story. We've shared a PDF of a facsimile of Study in Scarlet. Actually, we've shared a PDF of the entire Beaton's Christmas Annual from 1887, which included a study in Scarlet. You can download that on the Rosenbach's Sherlock Mondays page. Um, and we will do this for every story. So every story, especially then when we hit the strand, we'll have a facsimile of the strand with all the Sydney Paget illustrations in them as well that you can see. And you'll then you'll have the illustrations. So especially if you're listening to the podcast, that's where to get the illustrations that we're talking about. Um, one of the things I will be carefully looking at, Anastasia, is the way the characters of Holmes and Watson develop over time. Mm -hmm. as putting them together. This is a great way to do it. Like when you start from the beginning, you can kind of see like, how is he portraying, especially with this first one, right? Because he doesn't think this is a series. This is a <laughs> one-off. And I'm just creating these two characters who are going to do this thing. And then that'll be that. And then, <laughs> and then it goes on. So it'll be interesting to see 
in what ways he portrays them as we go along. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, well, let's, let's be blind and call it lack of continuity as you go on and, and really lack end. of continuity in, in terms of characterization we'll is, is quite stunning. And we'll um, see with wounds, with names, you know, there will be with, some interesting With so things. many things. And, you know, most people who pick up Sherlock Holmes, they don't start with a study in Scarlet. They start with, you know, yeah the adventures and then they go back maybe to study in scarlet and they're sort of like what is this um but if you read it all the way through from chronologically like we're doing from the beginning you can really see the development of the characters and the way that holmes goes from knowing nothing about literature to like quoting horace and george Eliot and, and or, or george yeah. sand and um just knowing all these things he doesn't insist he insists he doesn't know at the very he insists beginning. He is not stored in his brain attic and yet it's all there. Or I guess you could yeah. say that Watson assumes he doesn't know because it's Watson making the list. Yeah. But Well, let's start out. Let me, uh, this is the um, uh, Beaton's Christmas annual. This is the way it looked when it came out. And the um, uh, the artist is unknown for the cover of this. We know the artist for the, illust the Sherlock illustrations that I'll show inside, but we don't know the artist for the cover uh, here. Um, but it was Beaton's magazine lasted from 1860 to 1898. It cost a shilling, uh, which was actually fairly inexpensive, especially when by the 18, you know, I mean, Dickens's serials in, in the 1830s were a shilling a month. Um, and this whole magazine cost a shilling for the Christmas number. Um it sold out before Christmas, which was which was a good sign for them. Um, it has advertisements in it, as as you could see here. Fries, cocoa, watches, pure coffee, essence, um, and it has illustrations. And when we get to the Sherlock Holmes story, this is the first illustration. We'll talk about this when we get to that moment in the story. Um, illustrations by D.H. Friston, um, but the first illustration of a Sherlock Holmes story that we will see. Um, I love that there's advertisements in this too. I, I love that idea that people were, you know, this is what they were getting. And, and it really, especially going back now, you know, over a hundred years later to read these stories, it really kind of helps us put us back into that time. Uh, I also do, um, as, as you know, Anastasia, I do a Pickwick monthly show. Um, people can find out more information about that on the Roseback site once a month. We talk about a, uh, a serial part of, of Charles Dickens's Pickwick papers as they were originally published in little serial, you know, monthly editions. That's a facsimile. I don't just have real facsimiles. Um, <laughs> or That's real, what you say. Real originals. That's just a facsimile. Um, and... Uh, but they are, they're all packed with, 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 with advertisements and, and, and it really kind of gives the flavor of the time that the characters themselves are in as well. Can I, can I go down a little academic rabbit hole here is that um, the rise of this kind of mass literature in the way that we think of it was made possible precisely because of advertising, because printing and publishing things is expensive novels were very expensive for example frankenstein was an expensive book it wasn't serialized but once they figure out that actually they can put advertisements in newspapers that means they can lower the cost to the consumer of newspapers because the advertising is paying for the you know upfront cost it's paying for some of the costs and so that creates uh you know, literature for a mass public that you can read um and this happens in england this happens in france and it's actually really cool because there are so many Sherlock Holmes stories where he, you know, takes out an advertisement in a newspaper. He reads a headline or he takes a newspaper and he's going through the various pages of it, looking what, what kind of font it, it uses because the culprit cut something out from a newspaper and pasted it and used that to send a letter. So um, the stories are published in the very media that Holmes is interacting with as part of um solving mysteries were part of part of his world and looking oh. at it like that fascinating well um i i yeah and, and 
I love, you know, going back and kind of delving into, you know, original publications um, and, the, and the readership for this, especially for these magazines that weren't primarily middle class. I mean, you know, everybody's, you know, reading them, but as the reading audience is growing by the end of the of the 19th century, the literacy rate has you know, dramatically risen. And, and it is due in part to the fact that uh, more reading materials were available to people. And that was uh, increasing the desire to read for people as well. Mm -hmm. Well, a little bit about Doyle, um, Arthur Conan Doyle. He has um, already published around 30 stories uh, before he publishes Study in Scarlet in nine years. Um, uh, he's published about 30 stories. Um, he is a medical doctor. He had served as a surgeon on a whaler for six months. He was a doctor on another ship that went to West Africa. Um, he's 27 years old. Now he has a general, he's a general practice doctor and he has a practice in South Sea and Portsmouth. Uh, he's just been initiated as a free as a Freemason. Um, I like that because that, that just makes him all seem like such a Victorian, you know, man. Um, uh, and he had been married. Uh, he, he, he's been married for two years when Study in Scarlet comes out, um, although they have no children yet. Um, and the story was originally called A Tangled Skein, um, which we'll see, you know, which you see in the story is, is mentioned. Um, and it was rejected by several magazines, and then Beaton's finally bought it for 25 pounds. Um, but they owned the copyright once they bought it. Um, and yeah, uh, if only if only he had held out and, yeah. and kept the copyright. But 25 pounds was a was a was a really great price for a story. So for for a doctor who wasn't making any yeah. money, being a doctor, yeah, he did well with that. Um, only a couple. Um, fragments of manuscript exist for study in Scarlet and also a page of notes. But interestingly, on, on that one page of notes, we do have uh, alternate names of, that he was considering for Holmes and Watson. Do you know what they are? You know, Anastasia? Uh, well, Holmes is supposed to be Sharon Ford, I believe. Sharon Ford Holmes and Watson was Orman, Orman Sacker. God, I, yeah, I, it's that, you know, let's, let's just say a prayer of gratitude that that yeah. did not happen. Can you imagine? The adventures of Sharonford Holmes and Dr. Orman Sacker doesn't have nearly as good a ring to it, but maybe that's just because we're so used to, you know, Sherlock Holmes and Watson. Mm -hmm. Um, and this also was El not elementary, my dear Orman, just yeah. doesn't, doesn't <laughs> sound the same. Uh, this was not intended as a series either. Uh, Doyle wrote this as a one-off. He, he wasn't like, I'm creating a multi-series, you know, Mr. Detective that I could put out there. That idea kind of, it didn't really exist. Um, there had been some series of stories about certain detectives, and we'll talk about a couple later in the show, Post Dupin, uh, uh, Gaborios Lecoq, but... Yeah, well, and there had been sort of... Um characters that kind of existed yeah. in popular culture that everybody knew and different people wrote stories about them but the idea of a character invented by a single person who has the copyright to that character yeah. writing multiple multiple novels uh, or stories yeah that was um unusual we will um so we'll see uh, uh, there was a question from max mcgee and i want to address this too and and he asks why we aren't going through the canon in chronological order. Max, why are you means, why are you why are you poking the bear with which the I'm stick? assuming he means the the order of stories that have later been investigated in the game. And I'm bringing this up only because I want to let people know, especially if you're new to this, you might not understand what playing the game is. Um, and with Sherlock Holmes, the game is that Sherlock Holmes and Watson were real. Um, Doyle was just the kind of the literary agent mm -hmm. who, who who publishes who helps Watson get his get the stories published, and they're real. So then, if they were real, then everyone has to go through and figure out well, figure out the history of what's actually going on. They, in the story, well, the, to real the life. idea, um, the idea is that we apply Sherlock Holmes's own methods to any discrepancies in the canon and yes we call it the canon um you know so for example is watson's 
wound in his shoulder or in his leg because he can't seem to remember. Some people are like, well, it went in his shoulder and went out his leg. That's the explanation. Um, because the real world explanation is Doyle just didn't remember, didn't care. That's a lot less fun. Yeah. But there is a big, there's there's a lot of people who do Sherlockian chronologies. And when they put the stories in the order in which they occurred in, you know, the the year that then the month that they occurred in in the in real history. Um and that's that's fraught with a lot of conjecture. You have to like really just kind of make wild guesses and and do f- and do fun things with it. It is it is a lot of fun playing the game with Sherlock Holmes. Um, but we're not gonna we're not gonna take it on that route for the show. Uh, I, well, because I, I there need to give there Martha is Conan Doyle his due. So yeah, well, and there is no definitive kind of intradiagetic chronology you know there there have been many many versions yeah people argue about this all the time and there have been many articles in the baker street journal about chronology but it's out there for people to investigate is a fascinating topic it leads you into all kinds of gloriously fun rabbit holes in you know victorian history and sherlock holmes and it's it's a lot of fun to do uh this is actually an easy story to date because we're kind of given dates in it and it's easy to put at the year that it's that it's set in um because of the story um and uh so we'll we'll get to the date a little bit in in a little bit when we start um this is part one studying the scholar was published in two parts um Part one is being a reprint from the reminiscences of John H. Watson, MD, late of the Army Medical Department. And again, here's like, we don't know what H stands for. We're not told in this story. And um, spoiler, we're never told what H stands for, (laughs) for Watson. Um, But that doesn't stop lots of people from making great guesses and and I don't want to give any spoilers to wh- wh- how one of those relates to uh, it's it's in sign of four that that we get some interesting uh, guesses for it. Um, the uh, and and it starts in that in that really interesting way too, which lends itself to being a kind of story that you can play this game with and 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 that they're real in that it is it purports to be reminiscences um uh, and this goes back and far as you know all 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 through literature um but especially in the 18th century when <laughs> when the kind of novel form that we know it as is first starting to take hold you think gulliver's travels is doesn't doesn't say it doesn't say like gulliver's travels by jonathan swift on the on the on the title page you know it's just like an account of the voyages or whatever by captain lemuel gulliver Robinson Crusoe is the same thing. Novels, as as they came to be formed in the 18th century and then on, were purported to be histories in a sense. So, yeah, well, and and um, if you follow the kind of um, there's a scholar named Catherine Gallagher who makes a really great argument for this, which is that there's kind of um, at this moment no literary model for sort of realistic fiction that isn't true there's there's a model for sort of um actual memoirs and reminiscences and there's a model for sort of like romances and epics and larger than life things but kind of small quotidian prosaic stories about normal real life people told in a real life way that is actually fictional there's kind of no no literary model for that it's hard for people to know what to do with that so um, that's part of the reason you end up with, yeah, Robinson Crusoe saying this is a true account and so and so because uh, that kind of helps people go, okay, I know, I know how to read this because it's saying I'm a memoir about the exploits of this person, just like other stories that are written in this kind of realistic style. Yeah. Um, let's get started. Chapter one, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, um, in the year 1878. I took my degree of doctor of medicine of the University of London and proceeded to Netley to go through the course prescribed for surgeons in the army. Um, I just have to say the first sentence, regardless of it, you know, being interesting or not. Um, But it is, you know, Watson has gotten his degree. He's, he's, he's a doctor. He's in the army. Then he goes into the fifth Northumberland Fusiliers as assistant surgeon. 
Um, the second Afghan war had broken out, he said. This is the uh, the second Anglo-Afghan war, which was the British trying to secure Afghanistan so the Russians don't take it, right? Like, you know, like as a as if as if as if the battles over there never you know go away the the, the conflicts this is the same throughout history um and watson is uh he gets to kandahar um and then misfortune and disaster as he uh is in the battle of my wand which happened in 1880 um the battle of my wand was um basically 25,000 Afghans versus 2,500 British soldiers. And uh, guess who won? The Afghans and the Brits were routed. And this is the battle that Watson is in. Um, he gets wounded. Um, misfortune and disaster is what happens to him. Um, except for the devotion and courage shown by Murray, my orderly, who threw me across a pack horse and succeeded in bringing me safely to the British lines. Mm -hmm. um, it's a starting like it's going to be an adventure story, which of which there are many, especially in the Victorian age, and especially these kind of overseas with soldiers and um, in, uh, in these empire stories. Um, well, I don't know. Is it? I mean, I, I was reading this earlier before we started to just kind of refresh my memory. And I was just thinking about just how how sad this reads, right? It's it's the great big British empire that he goes to serve in India, where he very much does not have a good time. And then he returns to London, which he calls um that great cesspool into which all the loungers yeah. and idlers of the empire are irresistibly drained so right. the heart of the british empire is a cesspool and yes. even though he's he has served this empire as a soldier bravely and got injured and 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 he's back in london and instead of accolades he he's injured he's miserable he can't afford his lodgings he doesn't know anyone he he's just not having a good time he doesn't have any you know validation or, or a sense of purpose and mm -hmm. i don't know rereading this there's there's a lot of conversations um and and debates and have been for a very long time about how does doyle feel about empire how do the sherlock holmes stories feel about empire there was an entire conference about that um last summer Sherlock Holmes and Empire um and it's interesting to think about how does this first chapter think about Empire yeah uh, and it is oh I, well I, I entirely agree with you and that and that's kind of my point like the first couple paragraphs are this you know I'm I'm you know I'm a doctor and I go in soldier and 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 I'm caught in this battle and then right away you get that change and then it's like I get enteric fever which is the curse of our Indian possessions. That's what he, that's what Watson here is at least saying about mm -hmm. you know, empire, um, that it brings curses on them. Um, his life is despaired of, he's weak. And then the the kind of, you know, coming back to, to, to England where he has no kith or kin, he's got 11 shillings and six pence a day, and he's living in the great cesspool <laughs> of the empire. Um, it is, you know, not... I mean, it's this is like there's lots of instances in these stories, for reflections on empire and colonialism. I mean, this is, in a sense, the kind of the the height of the British Empire, at least as far as its reach, you know, around the world. And when I say height, even that ordinary description packs meaning because it's the height of the British Empire for those in power, not for the mm -hmm. not for the, the the people that they're, you know, uh, colonized. Um, mm -hmm. And uh and Watson comes back with his health ruined, but this paternal government won't allow, you know, will, they'll allow him to recover, but they're not, you know, he doesn't have much to go on after this, you know, service. So, um, yeah, with with permission from a paternal government to spend the next nine months in attempting to improve it, it's there's just there's there it's so kind of acerbic there. It's oh, he gets a whole yeah. nine months. Thank you. And and I'm glad we're talking about this now because this is going to set up the second half because in the second half that, that, that we'll get to next week, I mean, that's 
The second part concerns not only a former colony of the British Empire because it, it go to America, but a but also a religious group who are setting out to create their own kingdom within there. And I think there's all kinds of empire questions that 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 Doyle is asking all through this all through this novel. Um, well, Watson uh, has uh, very little money. Um, uh, I have a couple questions here. Adam asks, uh, what degree does Doyle equal Watson? Um, or does him being a doctor not mean that? Um, I can a, I can answer that in a book that Doyle, that Doyle wrote. Wrap this around your cerebral tentacle. The doll and its maker are rarely identical. <laughs> I, well, might, I might have slightly misquoted, but... Um, so then Doyle at least doesn't think that he is the doctor. I mean, there's obvious similarities. Yeah. They're both doctors and, and so on. Um, and Doyle, of course, learned so much of this from his own doctor friend, Dr. Bell, who was his instructor, um, who was a kind of chill Holmes, who was very good at deducing things about people. So he he was a kind of Watson to that person. Yeah. Um, but... That, I mean, that's that's always the question of how much does an author put into their work, right? And you can never really know. I mean, I think there's always something, but you're not always going to know what. We will be able to get to a few questions here and there today, but not a lot of them. We've got a lot to cover. If you do have a question and you put it in the live chat and I don't get to it, be sure I will see it after the show and I will put an answer in the comments. Mm -hmm. Um. Watson now doesn't have enough money to live on, but he runs, he's going. One day I was standing at the Criterion Bar when someone tapped me on the shoulder and turning around, I recognized young Stamford, who had been a dresser under me at Bart's, St. Bartholomew's, where they learned how to be become doctors um, in London. And um, it's the building Shelling jumped off of in BBC Sherlock, yeah. same one. Um and that bar actually uh, exists. And there was for a long time a plaque there. And I think it is still there. Um, and I'm trying to get it here. Yeah, there, here, here, here's a picture of it. Here, New Year's Day, 1881, at the Cartierian Long Bar, Stanford Dresser at Bart's, met Dr. John Watson and led him to immortality and Sherlock Holmes, put up in 1981. We, we should have started the show on New Year's Day, Ed, clearly. Well, but, yeah. Well, then it's not till March to then the rest of the sort of, we couldn't drag it out. So, um, they, um, but it's a real place, uh, and it's a real place for the readers at the time. Uh, you know, Doyle is establishing this story in his real world, uh, using current events, the, 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 the uh, war in Afghanistan, uh, actual places, um, I find it interesting that later in the 20th century and kind of uh, kind of at the turn of the century, later in the 20th century, the Criterion Bar would actually garner a reputation as a place for gay men to hang out. Um, and whether that was in the case, that was already the case in 1880, I don't know. Um, but it would be fun to think that the first Sherlock story begins with an introduction in a gay bar. So, but we don't know. So, but it did get it absolutely had that reputation later, the criteria mm -hmm. are. So that we do know. Fascinating. Well, Stamford um, is the he's a friendly face in the great wilderness of London, and he invites him to have lunch with him at Holborn, another real place. Um, and uh Watson does there. Um and he says, you are thin as a lath and brown as a nut. Um, and, and I gave him a short sketch of my adventures. You know, all that kind of stuff I love to see in, in story where it's like, it, it's kind of meta in a sense. I'm giving him a short sketch of my, you know, we're getting that. He's writing that to us. Um, well, and it's so interesting because Stanford says, you know, you're very thin and haggard and also very tan. What happened to you? And then Sherlock yeah. Holmes will see him three pages we'll later and see he's thing. very thin and haggard and brown and, and, and tanned, tanned as a nut, and, and say, You have been to Afghanistan, I perceive. Mm -hmm. um, 
again, in a way like that, that kind of laying the clues out for the, uh, for the reader before, like we could have figured that out. Well, we knew where he was anyway, but you know, like the clues are there for us to see before Sherlock even says it. Um, <laughs> well, he has a friend he wants him to meet. He says a fellow working at the chemical laboratory, um, who needs someone to go halves with him and some nice rooms, which he had found. Um, and, uh, and Watson's Watson thinks that's a great idea. And Stanford's like, well, you don't know Sherlock Holmes yet. Uh, perhaps you would not care for him as a constant companion. Um, he's a little queer in his ideas. Um, queer doesn't mean what it does now as it did then, but I love that it's there. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and he is, um, he says he's a first class chemist. Um, he's well up in anatomy, um, but he doesn't take any systematic medical classes. He's desultory and eccentric, and he's got a lot of out of the way knowledge. Um, and, uh, uh, and it, he sounds like an odd guy. I mean, that's what he means by queer, that he's a really odd person. Um, and then we get this, and then this will happen. I mean, we've already had the beginning that he's injured and he's recovering still. And Watson says, I'm not strong enough yet to stand much noise or excitement. I had enough of both in Afghanistan to last me for the remainder of my natural existence. Um, and this, this will be, this will, this will recur throughout the story where the Watson is constantly saying how injured and weak he is and he can't quite be the adventure hero along with Sherlock Holmes. Um, a, a, a sign for me, I think, in that that, that it, it, it becomes clear that Doyle's not thinking that this is going to be an ongoing series. And if he is, it's going to be a that would be a very different relationship. The kind of invalid Watson and the active Sherlock Holmes would be a very mm -hmm. different series. Mm -hmm. Um, they go, he goes to meet him and he is, um, um, let's see, um, well, when he, before he goes to meet him, he, he tells him that, you know, one of the weird things he, Sherlock does is he beats the subjects in the dissecting rooms with a stick, uh, mm -hmm. to verify how bruises may be produced after death. So Sherlock spends a good bit of his time beating cadavers with sticks. Um, that qualifies as really odd. Um, <laughs> um, and he goes to meet him. And then we get the first words from Sherlock Holmes. At the sound of our steps, he glanced around and sprang to his feet with a cry of pleasure. I found it. I found it. Uh, I have found a reagent which is precipitated by hemoglobin and by nothing else. And he's... <laughs> all excited this made this scientific discovery here in the lab techno babble yes it is very much techno babble so as you can discover when you read annotated editions and and the annotators have done the work of really you know going through this and yes well actually that there's nothing there that's yeah not, it's it's not a that's not a thing in the same way that dilithium crystals aren't a thing but it's fine Let's do these next few lines together. Um, uh, Dr. Watson, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, said Stanford introducing us. How are you? He said cordially, gripping my hand with a strength for which I could hardly have given him credit. You have been in Afghanistan, I perceive. How on earth did you know that? I asked in astonishment. Never mind, said he, chuckling to himself. The question now is about hemoglobin. No doubt you see the significance of this discovery of mine. Never mind. It's all about me. I've just discovered something. And this is the first time we meet Sherlock. And he's he's got a, that quick observation that he can make brilliantly. And also like, and let's go back. Let's go back to something that I've just done. So that's how I get, like read the first meeting of Sherlock Holmes and Watson. I mean, it's almost like a, you know, hyper, hyper fixation kind of thing where, you know, if he's if he's interested in, in something, then the kind of social formalities don't even register. We'll see. There's a couple instances in this that I think kind of go against that, that we'll hit later as well. Um, um, and uh, 
he this is a and Holmes is telling him why this is so important. This is a you know it'll help you know it, 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 it'll help you know setting people free who have you know not committed crimes or um and and he's going to call it the Sherlock Holmes test. So um uh and he mentions all these different crimes that Holmes is always doing. He's got this history of crime running in his head and um. He says, oh, uh, you know, I, I, I dabble. Well, and he says, I have to be careful. Uh, I dabble with poisons a good deal. He held it in his hand as he spoke. And I noticed it was all modeled over with similar pieces of plaster, little like kind of band-aids, we would call them, that are all over his fingers. Um, and then he tells him about the rooms. I have my eye on a suite in Baker Street, uh, which would suit us down to the ground. You don't mind the smell of strong tobacco, I hope. And Watson says, I always smoke ships myself, I answered. Um, you know, well, it, it always makes me very curious where Holmes was living before this. You know, yeah. what what are his rooms like before this? None too uh, tidy, I imagine, um, mm. <laughs> especially with chemical experiments in them. I mean, Baker Street itself will later to get described as that. And, and we know how untidy he is. I can't imagine how untidy he is alone um but i i always have to i i always love the smoking references clearly i'm smoking i'm going to smoke a different pipe every show too uh, yes i thought would be of, good of course you are people to watch all these shows now i smoke during the shows because i get to do the show from home and but this is finally the show that i get to do where it fits the story <laughs> where the pipe works for the show so you can you can go through 142 types of tobacco as we do as we do this or a 143 well i would uh i would not be able to tell the ash apart let me tell you there's another you know one that isn't really possible to do but um uh i would certainly you know smoke that many pipes cigars uh, as we went through um and the ships, I smoke ships myself. I have to, because it's a tobacco related thing, is uh, Watson's talking about he smokes a kind of very coarse, smelly tobacco. Um, it, it could stand for, a, it could be an abbreviation of a brand name, but it's more than likely, there's enough references to a ship's tobacco in the late 19th century and other places that it was just a kind of generic term for this kind of rough tobacco that sailors would smoke. They would come in a little like, uh, a flake a little like bar and you would like pull a piece off of it and crumble it up for your pipe and it would it's just kind of pressed together so it can last being in pockets and being out a long time on the sea or wherever and that's the kind of tobacco that watson says he's smoking now which is not a good tobacco it's like it's kind of gross um but he doesn't you know clearly he doesn't care and sherlock wouldn't care either as we find in later stories with sherlock smokes um, he also says, uh, Sherlock says, uh, he, he generally has chemicals about and occasionally do experiments. And he says, I get in the dumps at times and don't open my mouth for days on end. Um, just let me alone and I'll soon be right. Um, and Watson, he gives his little, you know, he wants to give him the, the things that are, you know, not his vices. He says, he says, I keep a bull pup. Uh, you know, a, a bull terrier puppy. Um, he uh, he objects to rows because my nerves are shaken. Um, I'm not sure you want to live with this guy if your nerves get shaken easily. And I get up at all sorts of ungodly hours and I'm extremely lazy. This does not sound like, you know, <laughs> the Watson that we know from later stories. And also, that's the only mention of the bull pup. There's no puppy. <laughs> When we get to the, you know, no. Baker Street ever. So, well, there's a dog later, but unfortunately, Mrs. Hudson's, so. It's it's one of a long list of, you know, how many bull pups does Watson have? How many wives does he have? How many bullet wounds does he have? It's a mystery. Well, um, and then Sherlock also says, do you include violin playing in your category of rows? And he apparently also plays the violin. Um, and hopefully that will be agreeable to him. Uh, and then Watson, Watson um, leaves. And then after he leaves, he asks Stanford, how the deuce did he know I had come from Afghanistan? 
Um, and Stanford just says that's just his little peculiarity. A good many, many people have wanted to know how he finds things out. And Sherlock will explain to him his method uh, in the next chapter. Um, but before we do the next chapter, let me take a few moments to have a little break here and tell you all to learn more about the Rosenbach. You can visit rosenbach.org. We host a variety of on-site and online programs and courses and always welcome questions from listeners about how to use our collections. Our holdings are always accessible to researchers who make a free appointment to visit our reading room. You do not have to be credentialed to do that as well. The Rosenbach's community reaches all around the globe, brought together by our love for history, rare books, manuscripts, and the arts. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach and Sherlock Mondays by donation, which you can do at our website, or by becoming a member. Membership gives you free museum admission, discounts on programs and courses, and exclusive invitations to member-only events. You can learn more about how to become a member on our website, and a Rosenbach membership makes a great gift. We have so many members from all around the world, especially in our BiblioVentures audience. And thank you to all of you who have donated and joined our endeavors. You can also join us on the face group, Facebook group page, Sherlock Mondays, for lots more Sherlockian info, news, links, conversation, and fun. And you can always write to me at epettit at rosenbach.org. That's P-E-P-E-T-T-I-T -E -T -T -I -T at rosenbach.org. I love to hear from our audience. There's lots of great programs and reading courses coming up at the Rosenbach online and in person. Online courses on historical topics and on great books. Uh, in-person behind the bookcase presentations about our collections. Uh, and you can always visit the Rosenbach to see our exhibitions or to tour the historic house. Find out more at our website. And as I mentioned earlier, when Sherlock Mondays comes to a close with the adventure of the empty house, we have one more Sherlockian biblio venture to take you on. We're having an exclusive pay-only series on the Hound of the Baskervilles. It'll be eight episodes available by paid subscription, paid subscription only, that will run on the Mondays in May and June. Same format, myself and our special co-host talking to you, uh, taking you to Dartmoor, where a strange diabolical hound haunts the moors, preying upon the heirs of Baskerville Hall. What will the logically reasoning Sherlock Holmes do when faced with a supernatural creature? You don't want to miss out on this one. Registration is not yet open. Stay tuned in the coming weeks, and we'll let you know how you can register for the Hound of the Baskervilles. That's going to be fun. So, And we had to do that because we're going through the stories chronologically as they're published, and we get to the final problem, and then Doyle stops writing stories for, what, 10 years, and then comes back and writes The Hound of the Baskervilles, which is set before, you know, the final problem earlier in their career, and then returns to short stories with The Empty House. And so I thought since we had The Empty House, we definitely wanted to include the manuscript that the Roosevelt, we definitely wanted to include that in our run, but then we'll do The Hound of the Baskervilles, which we'll need to do over several episodes, because that's really the best way that it will work. There's so much to talk about in that as a novel. Um, so that's just a teaser for this first episode, we'll tell you more about that in future episodes. Chapter two, the science of deduction. Which in a later story, he'll also call the art of deduction. So is it an art or is it a science? This is a science. Ooh, good or question. is that or is that a false dichotomy made up in the 20th century by a guy named Snow? Hmm. Um, <laughs> um, I will, I will leave you with that. Yes. Dramatic tidbit. We could, we could. I know. I don't think we need to go down that particular rabbit hole right now. Oh, there's so many rabbit holes to go down and. I will for, for this one time, I will. The show's myself. already going to run really long tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, as it will, uh, it, it's always going to be, even getting the short stories and it's going to be like, we're going to be compressing things. Um, this one I think is especially long tonight because we, as the origin story and these little details i think are really key to really 
point out and highlight and 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 talk about in the uh, as uh, as as the first Sherlock Holmes story. Um, chapter two: The Science of Deduction. Um, they meet at two twenty one B Baker Street. A couple of comfortable bedrooms and a single large airy sitting room, cheerfully furnished and illuminated by two broad windows. So we get a very general description of what it looks like. Nothing inside yet because they haven't moved in. We'll get that in later stories. Um, and Holmes, uh, according to Watson, is not a difficult man to live with. Um, I I call, I can't swear on this show, so I can't call, <laughs> call you know, well, I call it, BS quiet I, in his ways. I call, his habits I call were regular. BS. Well, that's the way that Doyle's first creating this. I don't know if he means that ironically that Watson's not kind of noticing that he lives with this really odd guy, or it's just this is the way Doyle's portraying him to begin. No, with. I I really do think that you know because he was writing poems primarily for money, he really was just making it up as it went along, and he sat down to write a story and. Oh, this sounds good. This sounds funny. Is he going to go check whether it contradicts something that he wrote previously? He is. He is not. Well, what we do get is we get what Watson's first impressions, and um, some. I think it was uh, the great Sherlockian Edgar Edgar Smith said, like in the list of Sherlockian things that that Watson knows about Holmes, like he should have also included what I know about Holmes, nil. So, um, cause he doesn't seem, cause none of this stuff seems to really attach later on in later stories, but for this story, what we get is. Well, see, but that's, that's a sort of, that's a playing the game explanation is actually Watson's not very observant, whereas in a, um, a Doylean extra diegetic adaptation is, well, the author wasn't paying attention. So it depends on how you want to approach it. You can, if you want to really sort of immerse yourself in the story and kind of play along that you can say yeah Watson's not very observant which can also in fact be true um or you can sort of um take yourself out of the story and and explain it that way and it depends on how good you are at suspending your disbelief and enjoying the story even if you see all the holes in it let me hit a couple questions before we jump back into the story um uh some a question about poe experts in the sherlock holmes world but we'll do poe a little later um when it's mentioned when he's mentioned in the story uh Max, i don't know i don't think we have any poe experts on this show yet, do we mm, i wonder if there's any here so um the uh uh max asks um what variety of tobacco are you smoking i'm not smoking ships i smoke a virginia mainly blend i actually blend my own tobacco and that's what i'm smoking it's ed's blend of tobacco is what it is um i used to smoke a lot of these really cool sherlockian tobaccos arcadia mixture and uh and shag and honeydew they used to come from a company that no longer makes them um uh there's a question how many pipes do i have well you'll have to find out by tuning in every episode as i smoke a different pipe every episode probably two pipes i'm thinking every show is at least going to be a two-pipe show and um and uh uh someone asked how long will the podcast be available they're available forever as far as i know when we'll put the podcast up and they'll stay up the the show itself will stay up on youtube that everybody can watch it um uh you can you know if you miss it if you miss an episode it's always available to watch as well mm -hmm. all right um Holmes is uh also likes to take long walks uh in the lowest so, um... city Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's just as you were talking, I was flipping through and I finally found this. I just wanted to show the contrast between Watson and um, here is going. What, uh, Sherlock Holmes is so tidy. So I just want to read two sentences from a later story, which says the complete opposite. Um, this is from the beginning of the Musgrave ritual, um, where he says, you know, an anomaly is that although in his methods of thought, Sherlock Holmes was the neatest and most methodical of mankind, he was nonetheless in his personal habits one of the most untidy men that ever drove a fellow lodger to distraction. So, you know, well, which which is it, Watson? That makes sense after they've been living together for a while. They're like together for like two months. Like He hasn't gotten that untidy yet in the first couple months. 
is what I'm thinking. So later, it's like, it's like, like you can come up with an seat. answer to that. Like, but you're it, you're it, on your best behavior when a roommate just moves in because you need help with the rent. Yeah, could be. So takes a while. It could take a while to make your mess. Um, <laughs> but um, what we do get about Sherlock is that he likes to take walks in the lowest portions of the city. So like the kind of dangerous, you know, or, you know, criminal parts, perhaps. Um, Down by the docks or the places where Dorian Gray went to smoke opium or, you know, all, all we can make all these other Victorian literary references to where he went. There is a, uh, Holmes has a lot of energy when the working fit was upon him, but then days on end, he would lie upon the sofa. Um, dreamy, a uh, vacant expression in his eyes that I might have suspected him of being addicted to the use of some narcotic had not the temperance and cleanliness of his whole life forbidden such a notion. And we have to point that out because that will change considerably in our next story, The Sign of Four. Um, mm -hmm. The um, Holmes is rather, and we get, then we finally get a physical description. Holmes is rather over six feet excessively lean. His eyes were sharp and piercing, save during those intervals of torpor, to which I have alluded. Uh, his thin hawk-like nose, he has a chin. His chin has the prominence and squareness. His hands are invariably blotted with ink and stained with chemicals. And he has an extraordinary delicacy of touch. Um, so it's it, it's and and it's a description that winds up you know coming true in the in the Sydney Paget illustrations that Paget later for the Strand will really draw him and that that fits this description. But more on those illustrations later. Um, the um, oh, but and then also Watson talks about this kind of ret like he doesn't know what Sherlock Holmes does. Like what the heck do you do with your time? And Watson though more than once mentions this reticence that um, uh, not only Holmes shows him, but that he has to asking Sherlock what he does. And Watson also, again, with his health, my health forbade me from venturing out unless the weather was exceptionally genial. I had no friends who to call, to call upon me. Um, and um, there, and then uh, he notices the zeal for certain studies was remarkable for Sherlock. And within eccentric limits, his knowledge was so extraordinarily ample and minute that his observations have fairly astonished me. And then his ignorance was as remarkable as his knowledge. And we get this whole exchange between them where Holmes doesn't even know that the earth revolves around the sun. Um, and uh, and his answer to that is, what the deuce is it to me? You say that we go around the sun. If we went around the moon, it would not make a penny worth of difference to me or to my work. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not sure he really doesn't know that, but he's clearly making the point that it's just unimportant. It doesn't I matter. Just, and I just all, always find that so astonishing because you never know what minute aspect or, or well, I guess this is a minute, but sort of what factoid or tidbit or piece of trivia will be crucial to knowing whether a culprit or lie is is lying um there's this great bit of a bbc sherlock episode and i promise i'm not going to harp on bbc sherlock for all the time but um there's a great bit where holmes can only tell that a painting is forged through knowledge of astronomy because the painting has a picture of a comet in it but the comet only was in the sky later so that painting couldn't have been painted when when um the gallery selling it said it was being painted um so if, if he doesn't know astronomy and comets and, and how the sail steel bodies move he wouldn't have been able to solve that crime so what what is a useful tool for his brain attic and what isn't it i've always said yeah you know it it depends on the crime and we will and that's something to really pay attention to as we go along, because I think that's something that, you know, Doyle will just kind of ignore in the future. And then Holmes just winds up in the end knowing everything. Um, or, but, you know, maybe maybe he grows and develops in his profession and and realizes that his earlier opinions were naive. Who knows? I also. Um, uh, 
I also I watched uh, uh, Study in Pink uh, today from the uh, Moffat Gatiss uh, Sherlock. So I watched that today. So and I'm posting about all of the adaptations for the stories we do. I'll make a post about them on the Facebook group page. I already posted yesterday about the Peter Cushing uh, um, uh, Study in Scarlet from the 1960s. So I'll post about all of them. Well, Watson even makes a list. Uh, Sherlock Holmes is limits, knowledge of literature nil, philosophy nil, astronomy nil, politics feeble, botany variable, but he knows all, all the poisons <laughs> um, and uh, opium. Um, and then and then on and on, uh, uh, anatomy accurate but unsystematic, sensational literature immense. He appears to know every detail of every horror perpetrated in the century, plays the violin well, is an expert single stick player boxer and swordsman and has a good practical knowledge of british law so number 11 there and i feel i feel it's important to you know emphasize the meaning of sensational literature because i think these days when we see literature we we have a different definition of the word but a, a lot of what it's talking about here is um records of past crimes true crime may be sens yeah. sensationalized accounts of past crimes that that he's clearly using and um death and crime and hangings were huge entertainments in 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 the victorian times people would go see hangings as entertainment so um and, and there would be illustrations in, in all of these accounts of this published and clearly holmes is just following all of this maybe not out of a kind of yeah. macabre fascination but because that's his job to know what's going on what what crimes are happening what crimes are being written about mm -hmm. what watson is saying he's not saying that holmes reads novels he does not exactly read yes yeah he reads true crime tales so yeah he in the modern day Sherlock holmes would None of the adaptations do this, but he would probably be such like a true crime podcast person. <laughs> um, he also, uh, Watson says, he he alluded above to his powers upon the violin and, um, uh, and he would play these pieces. And then he said, sometimes the chords were sonorous and melancholy. Occasionally they were fantastic and cheerful um, that they reflected the thoughts which possessed him, that Holmes was kind of, kind of play the violin as a as a way of almost like as he's thinking about something he's playing the violin and then um he usually terminated them by playing in quick su succession a whole series of my favorite airs as a slight compensation for the trial upon my patience which i find to be interesting too because what what he's what he's letting us know is that sherlock is um uh He's paying attention to Watson. He, he he has some like he has some he has some empathy for his flatmate, or he's like scratching away on the violin over and over for hours. And he's like, oh, and then I'll finish with some with some few nice airs that I know you enjoy. And not not th that's not a sociopath, right? That's not someone who doesn't care about the people around him. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and that's the homes that we get right in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. But also this this whole Watson coming up with the list of Sherlock Holmes and trying to figure him out. Um, it's interesting. This is like the first mystery of the story. He says about this little the, the little mystery of Sherlock Holmes, and um, that's the first mystery that has to be discovered here. And Watson is trying to figure out the mystery of this person that I am living with. Uh, well, on the first chapter, it's called yeah. Sherlock Holmes, and only then, you know, chapter three, you get the Lauriston Gardens mystery. So, so um, yeah, the first mystery is Sherlock uh, from Watson. Watson, the investigator, and all he can come up with is his list. <laughs> um, he, um, uh, where, where are we now? Here we are. Um, he talks about Holmes' visitors, um, one little sallow, rat-faced, dark-eyed fellow who was introduced to me as Mr. Lestrade. We'll find out who he is a little later, um, and who came three or four times in a single week. But then it was also uh, a young girl fashionably dressed, a gray-headed, seedy visitor, uh, looking like a Jew peddler, um, little, you know, 
casual anti-Semitism, which we get in so much of the of the um, uh, Victorian stories here. Doyle not accepted. Um, slipshot elderly woman, old white haired gentleman. Um, that it's just this weird, varied, all different kinds of people visit him. Um, I would see this and I'd be like, oh, he's a drug dealer. But that's a modern conception of what that would look like when all these disparate looking people are visiting your house for just a few minutes at a time, especially because Holmes used to beg for the use of the sitting room and I would retire to my bedroom. That's not, I'm not saying that's what's going on. He's not dealing drugs with people. But um, uh, There's um, one of the Russian adaptations. I forget which one. I think it might be the Soviet one. Um, it plays us so comically where, you know, Watson moves in and he doesn't know what Holmes is doing. And there's all these just strange people coming in and out of um, Holmes's rooms. And one time he confronts one of them and it turns out to be Holmes himself, who is just like coming back in one of his elaborate disguises. And after that, Watson is sort of even more kind of what the hell is going on here? What 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 guy did I move in with? That's from the Russian ones, the Vasily uh, Levinoff one. I, I forget which Russian one it's from, but it's from one of the Russian ones, definitely. So the Levinoff ones are really good. I've seen the They're, they're, they're excellent. The, and there's a study on Scarlet in there, too. So I'm going to mm-hmm. definitely rewatch that and post about it. Yeah. Um, well, now we get a date here, and it's upon the 4th of March. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, And it's probably 1881. And it's just easy to figure out because the Battle of Maiwan, and then he's sent home, and then he's a little bit of time there recovering, and then it's the beginning of the year, you know, and so clearly it's 1881. I mean, 1882 would be a real stretch, but but probably 1881. Um, and uh, Watson is um, uh, unusually petulant. Uh, towards uh, Mrs. Hudson because she didn't, or it's uh, the landlady. I'm sorry. It doesn't say she's Mrs. Hudson. It just says the landlady, not given mm-hmm. a name in the first story. Um, Watson, being, like me, is cranky before he has his coffee, which, you know, real yeah. relatable, relatable. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, Oh, Watson's reading and he sees he's got a newspaper. Uh, is it a newspaper? A magazine. He's got a magazine and one of the articles has a pencil mark on it and he reads it. It's called The Book of Life. Yeah. And the, the writer claimed by a momentary expression, a twitch of a muscle or a glance of the eye to fathom a man's inmost thoughts. Uh, his conclusions were as infallible as so many propositions of Euclid. Um from a, from a drop of water, a logician could infer the possibility of an Atlantic or a Niagara without having seen or heard of one or the other. And Watson finds this to be his reaction. Absolute nonsense. What ineffable twat. Wow. <laughs> it's one of my favorite lines. Um, what ineffable twaddle. Um yeah, that's that's one I need to use, which I don't, I don't know why I never think of it in the moment. But, well, I know why, because it's ridiculous. And I, why would I think of those words? But uh, I'm going to try to say one ineffable twaddle the next time I come across something I find ridiculous. I'll, I'll hold you to that. All righty. Um, and then Watson says it's an evidently, evidently about the writer of this story, uh, this uh, uh, essay. It is an ev- evidently the theory of some armchair lounger who evolves all these neat little paradoxes in the seclusion of his own study. It is not practical. First of all, Watson was already doing this. He's the armchair lounger trying to figure out what Sherlock Holmes is making a list and trying to figure out, observe him of why, what he's doing and what he sees, like what he kind of does. But um the whole thing is really a kind of description of the inspiration for uh, Doyle's inspiration for the character of Sherlock Holmes, uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Joseph Bell, right? Um, mm-hmm. Surgeon and teacher at University Medical uh, Edinburgh Medical School, and Doyle was Bell's clerk at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. Um, and uh, uh, and this was all confirmed late, like Doyle confirmed it, that he based him. Other people saw it who knew Joseph Bell. 
Yeah, yeah. There are accounts of Bell seeing and Bell the patient wrote about and just, yeah. just looking at the patient and seeing, you know, they're pale, they have this and this and, and going, well, you're suffering from a withdrawal from drink or you're suffering from this. And he was right. So Doyle had seen had seen yeah. this be possible. And Bell would do the trick. He would bring people in and he would for the class and he would say and he would say he would say the guy's profession and and what recent activities he had just been doing by observing some of the tricks that Holmes does Bell used to do this you know for his students to really to reinforce and to to reinforce in them the 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 purpose of um uh uh observation as doctors that this is what they needed to do they needed to minutely observe as much as they could so they could figure out what was wrong with their patients yeah um, although, fun fact, this is also the kind of skill that's used by people who are sort of fortune tellers or what we call psychics or that sort of thing where they, they, you know, you come in and you want your fortune told and they observe you and they can see what you're worried about and they can see kind of the state of your clothes, your hair, your how you present yourself. And that's a lot of what they use. There's actually... Um, a television show called The Mentalist, which is sort of like, yeah. what if one of those former psychic fortune teller type people decided to become a consulting detective for the police and solve mysteries? And it also, it's kind of, it, it, the fact that he calls him an armchair lodger, lounger kind of harkens to the, what becomes the armchair detective too. The, you know, the detective like Nero Wolf, who he just sits and gathers all, has someone out gather the information and then he sits there and figures and it Holmes, out. Holmes is you know? so far from an armchair detective. He's yes, always out there in that. his costumes yeah. with his, you know, little eyeglass and his ruler and his everything, literally just craw crawling around, smelling things. He's, he's not an armchair detective. Well, as Watson had finishes kind of insulting the uh, author of this article, Holmes then says, as for the article, I wrote it myself. Um, and awkward. Uh, <laughs> you? Yes. I, I mean, can you can you imagine how awkward it is? You're just sitting there, you're <laughs> complaining about this idiot who wrote this article. And then and then the guy you live with is like, actually, that was me. Yeah. Ineffable what? what? Ineffable what? Twat? Twat? <laughs> so, um Holmes says I have a turn both for observation and for deduction and I depend upon them for my bread and cheese um and then Watson says how Holmes says I suppose I am the only one in the world I'm a consulting detective if you can understand what that is and it's that when um he helps police uh and, and government government detectives and private ones when they are at fault, they come to me and I manage to put them on the right scent. They lay all the evidence before me and I am generally able by the help of my knowledge of the history of crime to set them straight, um, which is a kind of armchair detective, but we know that he also goes out a lot and we'll see him do that soon. Um, and he says, if you have all the details of a thousand at, at your fingertip, finger ends, that is misdeeds, it is odd if you can't unravel the thousand and first. Um, which goes back to his knowledge of sensational literature, which is, you know, the idea that crimes are similar. There's patterns in crimes, there's patterns in motivations for how people commit crimes. And so if he has this vast knowledge of sensational literature of all, all the different ways people have committed crimes before, then he will be able to use those resemblances to solve the next one. Yeah. And they, <laughs> we also find out that this is how how Holmes starts his career here is that mostly the people that visit him are sent on by private inquiry agencies. So people are going to private agencies to track someone or figure something out, and they're recommending Holmes uh, to solve the case for him. Um, and he says, he gives a kind of way that he solves cases. Um, now and again, I have a case turns up, which is a little more complex. And then um, he has a lot of special knowledge. Um, and then he uses rules of deduction. Uh, observation with me is second nature. Um, he says, you had come from Afghanistan. Um, when, when I first met you, I, I had said that. And he explains, you know, how he knew that, you know, because um, uh, he had the, he, he, he was a medical type. 
Um, he had the air of a military man, uh, clearly an army doctor. He came from the tropics for his face was dark and his wrists were fair. He's undergone hardship and sickness at his haggard face. His left arm has been injured. He holds it in a stiff and unnatural manner. And where would have been wounded? Clearly in Afghanistan, because that war that, that war had been going on then. Um, and we get the first example of Holmes describing his method, like that he's made an observation and he describes how he's come up with it. And this is the trick that will now happen all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Watson's a stunt. And, and Watson says, all right, we finally get it. He says, um, you remind me of Edgar Allan Poe's Dupin. I had no idea that such individuals did exist outside of stories. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to I'm going to let you take this bit because I can tell you want to talk about it. Well, yeah, I, this can't turn into the Poe show. Um, but uh, if people don't know, I do a lot of po Edgar Allan Poe work. So this is this kind of this always kind of hits me. Um, but that that Doyle would name check him is 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 really great because Holmes is a Dupin. Um, he is you know, very much modeled on and, and Doyle knows this and admits it and talks about how great Poe is and and how great his creation is and and it's not like a it's not like Doyle keeps it a secret. Um, and Poe's Dupin stories kind of influence all of of mystery detective fiction. Dupin calls it ratiocination. And that's his, his method. That's what he refers to as his method of observing and then figuring out in the train of, you know, in a train of logical, you know, steps, how something occurs. Um, but the Dupin stories, which Poe first, he wrote them in the 1840s, Philadelphia. Um, of course, that's where the mystery detective story was invented. Um, and the first one is Murders in the Room Morgue, and then The Mystery of Marie Roget, and then uh, The Purloin Letter, which was written in New York City uh, when he moved there. Um, but those stories establish the basic rules of the mystery detective genre, or what become a kind of template that so many people use. There's an insoluble mystery, like it's like something has happened and nobody can figure it out. There is an analytical detective who is a genius who uses deductive reasoning to read clues and discover the solution. There's also an observant but less astute companion, usually the narrator, stands in for the reader. Here it's Watson, who's mystified by the, you know, by the, you know, what's going on. Um, and there's an inept police force, and that's why the detective needs to be there to figure it out. And it's not the mystery's solution itself that entertains the reader. It's mm. the steps the detective takes, the unraveling of the tangled skein that, mm -hmm. um, that, that makes a, a mystery detective story. And that's the formula that Poe comes up with that Doyle, the, some of those pieces were, were in stories before Poe, but not in that whole group. And Poe comes up with that and other people then take it and run with it. Oh, and I will add this whole conceit of sort of um, writing writing something that is clearly influenced by something else and then having that brought up by a character to sort of go, no, that was totally not real, fake, made up, fantasy, yeah. not what I do. That's a very common kind of literary conceit in order to kind of get the author to try to take his stories more seriously than whatever had come before in that particular genre. So, um, for example, if you read uh, Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon, um, they obviously reference Poe because he wrote the story about a balloon trip to the moon called The, the Adventure of Hans Fall. And in the Verne story, they mention Poe and they're sort of like, yeah, Poe, like all the other space writers who are just completely making things up. But we're actually going to go to the moon, just like here Holmes is saying, well, yeah, Dupont was a very inferior sort of fellow, showy and superficial, but I'm the real deal. Yeah. And, and, and in reality, just like Verne's story was heavily influenced by Poe. I mean, he read Poe, he wrote about Poe. This was very much influenced by Poe. You can tell he obviously read Poe. But in order to kind of create this realism, to make this story feel not derivative, to get the reader to invest in Sherlock Holmes as a character and not just sort of like a caricature of Dupin, he's um, 
kind of lampshading it. And it, um, it's this is kind of a technical term, I think, from um, TV show and movie writing, where if there is a glaring plot hole, you kind of you hang a lampshade on it, which means you have a character pointed out, because if you do that, then you kind of you beat the viewer to the punch and then you can move on. And the audience can't complain about it because, you know, there's a plot hole. They're aware there's that plot hole. Yeah. And and that 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 Holmes even criticizes Dupin. He's like, oh, he's an inferior fellow and he didn't do it the right way. Mm-hmm. Also kind of makes and he also well, because then Watson will mention another author, and that's uh, Gaborio and his uh, Monsieur Lecoq, uh, Lecoq, who is a fictional detective as well. He's a master of disguise, all that kind of thing. And and Holmes kind of criticizes him as well. And it kind of creates this, we're reading a fictional story about a fictional detective who's talking about other fictional detectives as if they're real, even though he mentions their creator. But he doesn't like kind of say like their creator, the created and it's fictional. He just says like what Poe knew of Dupin. Um, mm-hmm. And then it creates this, it's it's this alternate world that's existing out there especially when you read it over a hundred years later. Um, I used to ask students when I, when I used to teach college at that, if, and I had a whole long list of things that I would ask them in the beginning of a lit class. And one of them was, was Sherlock Holmes real or fictional? And there would always be a couple of people that say he was real because it just seemed, why isn't he? Like it was some guy who lived then who did this stuff and now they make movies about him and all. And of course these movies aren't really true, but it, because it's so long ago, it's not hard to figure that it's not hard to, to think that he might have been real. Um, and it's, uh, it's funny. It reminds me of the time I tried to explain the game to my dad. And I was like, well, we play the game. We pretend that Sherlock Holmes is real and his creator fictitious. And my dad slams his fist down on the table and goes, what do you mean pretend? Sherlock Holmes was real. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you if you're uh, very if you really play the game, you never admit it. Um, mm. but it is, but what I get is it's almost like Doyle is starting. Doyle is the one who starts the game in a sense in this and trying to, in setting these stories in the real world and doing things like this, where he treats other fictional characters as real as well, that kind of reinforce that idea that Sherlock is alive and well in London. So Sussex. Sussex. So, well, that later these days, now, these when, days. He's, when he's writing the story then it's like yeah. that's where yeah. it is so well someone is coming to visit them and um it turns out that um it is uh, Holmes right away says oh he looks out the window and he sees him and he's like oh a retired sergeant of marines is coming and uh, uh and then he'll visit and he, again he's doing that thing where he he can look at somebody and and tell you who they are and that's in chapter three, the Lauriston Gardens mystery. Um, and uh, this um, uh, this man has come and given him a uh, um, uh, uh, what's like a little package here, um, a letter. He's given him a letter. And um, Watson uh, first asks, "How did you know?" And and Holmes says, "How did you know he was a retired sergeant of the Marines?" I have no time for trifles," he answered brusquely. Then, with a smile, "Excuse my rudeness. You broke my tra- thread of thoughts." And then he explains it to him again. Another example where Holmes might be single-minded, but with Watson as it may, as his new flatmate, he's always careful of his feelings, and he's not he's not brusque and mean to Watson at all in this in this first story, or really ever. Um, although he will call him stupid uh, a couple times in later stories. Um, uh, but he does take the time and he tells him how he figured it out, um, which then sounds easy to all of us. And that's the effect that this always has in the story. Well, there's a there's a letter. The letter here is from Tobias Craig Gregson, who is uh, an inspector Um uh, and they have discovered a body of a gentleman, well-dressed and having cards in his pocket, bearing the name of Enoch J. Drebber, Cleveland, Ohio. No robbery, uh, nor is there any evidence as to how the man met his death. Marks of blood in the room, but there's no wound on the person. I mean, this is like a perfect Dupin mystery, right? If only the door was locked. 
Um, right. And uh, uh, and they want Holmes to come. And Holmes then tells Watson that he's the, he's the Gregson is the smartest of the Scotland Yarders. Uh, he and Lestrade are the pick of a bad lot. And we had already had the description of Lestrade. Talk, talk about a backhanded compliment. Yeah. <laughs> and Lestrade's the rat faced, uh, sallow fellow that Watson saw visiting before. Um, uh, uh, they are quick and energetic, but conventional, but they're also as jealous, jealous as a pair of professional beauties. Um, that they both want to solve the crime and and get it over on the other one. It's um, it's funny because you know literally two pages later, maybe it's two pages before Watson describes Holmes as as jealous of his art as a schoolgirl is of her beauty or something <laughs> like that. So you yeah. know, pot kettle. Yeah. Um, well, Holmes is like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to go out and do this. And Watson's like, you're just complaining. You got nothing to do. And so Holmes just says, get your hat. Um, he's going to go. Come on. He says, get your hat. You wish me to come? Yes. If you have nothing better to do. A minute later, we were both in a hansom driving furiously for the Brixton Road. And so it begins. This is it. This is the first you know, adventure they're out on together. Watson, the invalid, wounded, can't like cope with anything, but Holmes says, get your hat and off they go. Um, well, part of Watson's problem is that he's very bored and clearly depressed because he's very bored. So who knows? A nice murder might help. Yeah. Um, they, um, they are on their way and Watson says, um, oh, Holmes is talking about fiddle, Cremona fiddles and a Stradivarius and a Mati. And Watson's like, you just read this letter about this crime. Aren't you thinking about that? And Holmes says, no data yet. It is a capital mistake to theorize before you have all the evidence. It biases the judgment. That's an important Sherlock, you know, quote, uh, you know, idea. Uh, don't theorize before you have all the evidence. Well, they get to number three, Larson Gardens, but they stop before there and because Holmes wants to walk and he does. And he he checks. He, he's very careful and he looks at the ground as they're going up um, uh, uh, through the garden. I mean, I just want to pause here and talk sure. about the, the description of Lauriston Gardens, because um it really it recalls to me the the first couple of paragraphs of the fall of the house of usher where if you go through and you circle every single word that's sort of dreary depressing ill omened bad you're you're just going to be circling every other word i mean here you have ill omened minatory melancholy vacant blank and dreary bleared pains sickly plants yellowish in color the whole place was sloppy from the rain. Um, I mean, can you yeah. like can can you think of a place that's that's sort of that's more dreary and depressing and even dare I say it, even though Mary Lorna are here, dare I say it, gothic. I mean, you know, you want you want a murder, and is the murder going to be in a nice lavish country house like you have so often in St. Agatha Christie mystery? No, this is this is a dump it's screaming murder and then you go inside and you have a murder it's not only does it set the mood but uh, it's just there's something very interesting about it especially because in a later story there's this great scene where they're out in the countryside to solve a murder and watson is just sort of like look at all of these beautiful mansions in the countryside and holmes is like yeah, and there's probably so much crime going in every single one of them, but we don't know because they look idyllic on the outside. Yeah. But this, this is in London, that whole cesspool of the empire. And in that cesspool of the empire, um, the the inside resembles the outside. Very much. And and I love you pointing out those words. And it is very Poe-like, too. Uh, in mm -hmm. the yeah, I think there was somebody in the Q&A who sort of said, you know, Poe fans, how much, how much Poe do you notice in these first few chapters? Yeah. I, a lot. Um, and Doyle is is great at these kind of descriptions of, of mm -hmm. scenes and setting us up. And, and we'll see that all through. I mean, even even the little and, and it kind of it. it, it <laughs> Excuse me. It kind of um, 
contrast with the um uh, as they're driving along or no, that's later as they're driving along and we get other descriptions too that that you know he's he's very careful at setting the scene for us but more than just setting the scene and describing the what it looks like but also the mood and and uh, all those words definitely do that um they um Holmes observes all around the house first leading up to it and then and then we meet Gregson tall white fast white faced flaxen haired man with a notebook in his hand um uh Lestrade is there as well he says and um uh Holmes asks did you come here in a cab um which will have some bearing later but um they go in and see the uh uh the body on the floor and I like Watson's description of the body here also shows the kind of prodigious skill of observation you know that like he's he's incapable of making the i can see the things and so this it means this but he is able to see what's going on and this is something that that holmes i think will wind up relying on later um but it's a grim motionless figure uh stretched upon the boards a man about 43 or 44 years of age middle sized broad shouldered with crisp curling black hair and a short stubbly beard um his coat, his pants, uh, immaculate collar and cuffs, top hat, well brushed and trim. Um, but on his rigid face, there stood an expression of horror. And as it seemed to me of hatred, such as I had never seen upon human features. And then this very interesting. He had a low forehead, blunt nose and prognathous jaw gave the dead man a singularly simious and ape like appearance. Um, this idea that this kind of there's there is that Victorian phrenology waving yeah. waving its hand. The criminal types, you know, like the Cesar Lombroso thing, who where you can you you know a criminal by the way they look, and what do they look like? They look like apes. They look like primitive humans that kind of you know that are now coming back to hurt us. You know, it's one of the great anxieties of the Darwinian age. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, although, um, I'm not sure at what point Lombroso was translated into English. I think it actually right took a while, right but this, around, this it's was in the 1880s though. What, so yeah, I don't but, know if, but if he's even, aware of it, but the idea is certainly there. Yeah. Even, even without Lombroso, this is just so much in the air, a lot with how Darwin got reinterpreted and misinterpreted yeah. and just, um, some good old Victorian racism peppered into there and it. It just sort of per pervades everything. All right. Well, Holmes sees, uh, he says there, um, there's no wound, but there's blood around there. Uh, the blood belongs to a second individual. Um, and um, Holmes examines the corpse, nimbly his nimble figures, fingers flying here, there, and everywhere. He sniffed the dead man's lips and glanced at the soles of his patent leather boots uh, and as they raise him, a ring tinkles down and rolls across the floor. And like, there's been a woman here, Lestrade. He's like, it's a woman's wedding ring. And and they think that, you know, this will be the key to the whole case now. Um, mm -hmm. Well, uh, there is, um, there's a somewhat famous phrase, chercher la femme. It means look for the woman. And it actually also comes from a kind of early detective story from sort of around this time, the uh, 1850s. Alexander Dumas actually wrote a very, very, very long novel called The Moicans of Paris. And one of the subplots in there is there is a detective who's trying to solve a crime. And what he always says is, cherchez la femme, look for the woman, because there's mm -hmm. always a woman. Either a woman committed the crime or a man committed the crime because of a woman. So, of course, a woman is going to be involved. Well, it's certainly what Lestrade thinks, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. Holmes has got this half figured out already. Um, yeah. And uh, they, um, let me share, this is the illustration. Oh, Because Lestrade then says, oh, wait, on the wall. And they discover that written in blood on the wall is this uh, word here. Let me uh, share the, because this is, this is the illustration here. And it says Racha. R A C H E. And so here's our first illustrator of Sherlock here. 
And this is what he looks like. And this is Watson over here, right? And this is Gregson and Lestrade, I imagine, but um, uh, next to him. Um, the, um, the illustrator of this is D.H. Friston, who um, it was engraved by uh, W.M.R. Quick. Uh, some uh, frequently illustrators didn't do their engravings, or sometimes they did. Um, and uh, Friston had uh, was was a was a was a really great illustrator at the time. He had also done two illustrations for uh, Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla, um, oh. including a very oh. famous one with uh, um, uh, Carmilla, the vampire, reaching across the bed for Lara and General Spielstorff in the background with a sword. He's about the Russian. That's 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 Friston as well. Um, but, uh, this is our, the, the first readers of Sherlock Holmes. This is how they picture him. Um, he's got the hawk like nose. Um, the hat's unusual. It's clearly not a deer stalker. And, and of course it won't be a deer stalker. So I meant to put my deer stalker on when we started the show because I was telling everybody about deer stalkers. There we go. Um, mm. but, um, I'll stop the share so people can really see my deer stalker. Oh, you got to put it on. Very, right. very nice. I'll put it on at the end. Um, the um uh that's what they discover that that name lestrade thinks oh it must be you know he was somebody was trying to write rachel and <laughs> left off the the and got interrupted before they wrote the final letter and um uh holmes uh uh doesn't respond right he says um he was going to write rachel uh, oh, but yeah, and they're just taunting Holmes now. Like, oh, you think, you know, like we'll we'll solve this crime now. And Holmes measures the room and then uh, and that's it. Um, he uh, he says, um, uh, you're doing so well now that it would be a pity for anyone to interfere. Uh, there was a world of sarcasm in his voice as he spoke. And uh, and he asked about the constable who discovered the scene, and that's who he wants to go talk to. Uh, that'll give him more information that the guy, than these guys can give him. Um, but then going out, Holmes has got his parting shot here, right? Uh, there has been murder done, and the murderer was a man. He was more than six feet high, was in the prime of life, had small feet for his height, wore coarse square-toed boots, and smoked the Trinocopoli cigar. He came here with his victim in a four-wheeled cab, which was drawn by a horse with three old shoes and one new one on his off foreleg. In all probability, the murderer had a florid, florid face and the fingernails of his right hand were remarkably long. And these are only a few indications, but they may assist you. So, um, completely shaming <laughs> the detectives here that he has come up with all this information just by observing the room. And there is somebody in the Q&A asking you to smoke that particular cigar on the next show. A Trichinopoly cigar is, yes. um, uh, I'm not gonna, it's, it's a cheap cigar uh, <laughs> from India, or then it was, um, it's a place in, in, in India. It's a cheroot, which means they clip both ends off and um, they would be, it would be fermented in like fruit juices. So they were like a little bit sweet and strong. Um, Churchill really liked them actually, um, but they're, they're, they're gross. Uh, and uh, it's a cheap cigar is what it is. Um, but, you know, there you go. I'm not going to smoke one. Um, <laughs> uh, See, and that's, then, that's what we need you for. These, these valuable cigar annotations. So, I'll tell you so what the cigars are and all that, that stuff. We know if the culprits or, or the victims are smoking cheap cigars or not. Yeah. That's important. And that's what and, he means though, by it. like, it, it's like, it's somebody, he might be well off, but he smokes a cheap cigar is what he's saying. Mm -hmm. um, and then he said, and they asked, how was it the murder done? And he says, poison. And then he tells he tells Lestrade that Rache is the German for revenge. So don't lose your time looking for Miss Rachel. And then he leaves. All right, we got we got to blow through these last few chapters here. Um, chapter four is what John Rance had to tell, and Holmes visits the patrolman who discovered the scene, um, and. Uh, he um he tells what he he gives a little explanation to Watson how he figured out the height of the man and then the hoofs and all that kind of stuff and that was all by the way he was observing things as he was going along again the you know the explaining the trick here um 
which he loves to do. Uh, Watson asks about the cigar, and then he says, oh, I have written a monograph on the subject of cigar ashes. I flatter myself that I can distinguish at a glance the ash of any known brand, either of cigar or of tobacco. Uh, and we'll we'll revisit that again in the next story, Sign of Four. Um, uh, the florid face, and Holmes is like, I'm not going to tell you everything just yet. <laughs> Like, like, like he doesn't want to be wrong about the florid face. So he's not going to say it yet. He's going to make sure he has it all. But then Watson does the thing here in the story that's for the reader, right? He now asks us, he now asks all the questions. How came these two men, if there were two men in empty house, what has become of the cabin? How could one man do this? Where did the blood come from? What was the object of the murder? How came the woman's ring? Why did the second man write the word rock, rock on the wall? Like, Watson asks our questions for us. And this is a great thing that Doyle does to really keep mm -hmm. the reader involved and understanding what's going on in the story is that we have a representative. We have someone who also can't figure out what the heck Sherlock Holmes is doing, how he's coming up with these, you know, uh, answers. So mm -hmm. and um, there are there are a couple of stories that are written from Holmes's point of view, and they yeah. are terrible because <laughs> it's it's terrible when you don't have a watson to to make holmes look enigmatic and mysterious well holmes tells him that that the the german word was just to put the police on the wrong track by suggesting socialism and secret societies um uh which were you know very active then these revolutionaries at the time and the anarchists and um uh, but Holmes says it wasn't done by a German because he could tell by the way he did the letter, especially the letter A, that that's not the way the Germans write the letter A. Um, well, this is the line that like Holmes is sensitive to flattery on the score of his art as any girl could be of her beauty. Um, so um, they um, get to John Rance here, the constable, and Holmes gives him half a sovereign to tell him what he saw and uh and holmes is constantly telling rance what he did so then you walked over here and then you saw this and rance is like what how did you know were you were you there too and um uh and rance confirms everything that that holmes uh thought um but he also says that there was a um uh a drunk man that appeared on the scene um, who was very drunk and was like singing about Columbine's newfangled banner, which meant that he was an American singing like, you know, the Star Spangled Banner or something. Um, and uh, and that he was a long chap with a red face. So now Holmes is confirmed in many of his uh, um, deductions and uh, Watson then asks, um, or Holmes says, um, uh, Watson, or Watson says, why should he come back to the house after leaving it? Holmes says, the ring, man, the ring. That was what he came back for. And then we'll bait him with the ring. And then Holmes has this great line, I might not have gone, but for you. And so have missed the finest study I ever came across, a study in scarlet. Eh? Why shouldn't we use a little art jargon? There's the scarlet thread of murder running through the colorless skein of life, and our duty is to unravel it and isolate it and expose every inch of it. And now for lunch. Um, and that's the oh, and, that, and a violin concert. Yeah. Yes, and 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 a drink of uh, uh, of the the scarlet skein here from from mm. that Mary L. Caro design. We could have played a drinking game with this. Anytime Scarlet is said, skein, you know, thread, have a drink. Mm -hmm. All right, that's delicious too. Um, chapter five, our advertisement brings a visitor. Um, Watson is trying to rest, but he's having horrible dreams um, that apparently this investigating this murder is really upsetting him. It's very stressful. And he's, you know, uh, surprised that this is uh, um, uh, uh, doing this to him, um, that he had, he's already seen, you know, so much, you know, in the army and that this is this is uh, this is but this is upsetting him. Um, and again, he's asking questions. He's been poisoned. Um, how did that happen? Whose blood was it? 
Um, and uh, but Holmes is more interested in playing music uh, as he's thinking about this. Um, Holmes says, uh, there is a mystery about this which stimulates the imagination. Where there is no imagination, there is no horror. That sounds like a good Poe line, right? Like if I it, it sounds there. like something Anne Radcliffe would say, actually, with her delineation between oh, there you go. Um, horror and terror. And um, yeah. horror, but the way she outlines it, horror is what kind of freezes the nerve. So you don't really feel anything except for sort of this kind of shock that shuts everything down whereas terror which is often the mysterious and the unknown stimulates the imagination and then you feel all sorts of things and it's kind of very exalting so yeah um it seems here this is this is really kind of it's it's messing with watson because it's really provoking his imagination it's not okay i'm in battle and and my comrades got hacked to death i mean that's horrifying but it's very straightforward there's there's something more here that he can't let go of and it it frightens him um yes and holmes recognizes that and 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 kind of has a little talk with him about it in a sense like holmes is concerned for his feelings um and that watson is upset and again, I think that's the third time in this story that Holmes has showed some kind of concern for. And I only say that just because that it kind of goes against the the idea that a lot of people think of Holmes and Watson and the way their relationship works. But in this first story, especially, um, they're you know they're not quite a team. They're definitely not a team yet. Um, but uh, but but Holmes is uh, is fond of Watson immediately. Um, mm-hmm. Well, they put out the uh, Holmes puts out an advertisement uh, that they found the ring. They found a ring, and that somebody will come get it. And Holmes knows that the the murderer will come back for it, thinking that perhaps he just dropped it in the street. Um, he gives the address and Watson's name because he's afraid someone might recognize his name. Um, and um, he has Watson get his revolver ready in case there's danger. Um, they are dealing with a desperate murderer. Um, and, uh, but who shows up is a very old and wrinkled woman in the apartment. And, uh, she says the ring belongs to her girl, Sally, who was married only this time, 12 months. And oh my gosh, I'm so happy you found it. And, and Holmes tries to catch her out by saying like, oh, well, if she lived there, had the ring get here. And the old woman has a story of how the, why the ring was there um that the uh um uh she's she's got a quick answer for it and then she they so they just give her the ring and she leaves and holmes rushes out to follow he says i must i'll follow her she must be an accomplice and will lead me to him wait up for me and watson of course can't go out he's just too much of an invalid he can't go out chasing people um he sits stolidly puffing at my pipe and skipping over the pages of Henry Merger's V de Bohème, um, Scenes of a Bohemian Life, which was a French novel, which was a, a made into operas. But I think it's fascinating that this is what Watson's reading, a book about these kind of bohemian artists. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of the kind of, you know, bohemian artist traits in Sherlock, especially in stories to come. Yeah, yeah. And um what is it the one with Irene Adler uh um, on Bohemia yes that the, the, the one with Bohemia, Bohemia name. in the yeah. name um well you know Watson says that Holmes has a Bohemian soul which uh yeah. would have meant all sorts of things in the 19th century including sort of artsy care um kind of unusual yeah. a bit of an outsider yeah certainly not you know kind of you know John Bull, straight, you know, straight and narrow, conservative kind of people. But Holmes isn't that kind of person. Um, mm-hmm. um, Holmes comes back. Uh, didn't you get her? Old woman be damned. You know, it wasn't an old woman. She got in a cab and then jumped out at some point and I lost her. Um, that it was apparently some, you know, a- an incomparable actor um, who had come in and disguised as an old woman that tricked them. Um, so 
that doesn't lead him to it. Chapter six, two chapters to go here. We'll get through these quickly. Tobias Gregson shows what he can do. Um, Watson's reading the newspaper accounts and they're kind of funny how like they, they vary in their kind of, you know, biases to what the kind of paper writes about, but there's the, 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 the one paper writing about the murders, a sign of perpetration by political refugees. And the other one's like, oh, it's the liberal administration. It's letting all the criminals in the country and and the other ones about um uh um uh the how we're not ta- we don't take care of the people uh, enough and so all the you know the criminals come in but don't worry because inspector gregson will you know solve the crime um and uh holmes um that's a little French quote there, right? His reaction to that is, I don't have the French quote here. Oh, yeah, here it is. Un salt trouve toujours en plus so qui l'admire. A fool always finds a greater fool to admire him. Is mm-hmm. Holmes's, you know, reaction to the praise that the police get over this. Um, a uh, a great uh, uh, tumult happens here, pattering of many steps in the hall. And Holmes says, ah, it's the Baker Street Division of the Detective Police Force and a dozen of the dirtiest and most ragged street Arabs that ever I clapped eyes on have rushed into the room. These little street kids that, you know, live in London. Uh, Holmes calls them the Baker Street Division. Uh, Not the other word yet. That happens, I think, in the next story in Sign of Four when they're called the Irregulars. But we get them right off the bat in the beginning here is this um he's using them wiggins is their is their is their head and he's had them going around to find out some information and they said they haven't found it out yet um and then he tells watson there's more work to be got out of one of those little beggars than out of a dozen of the police force they go everywhere they hear everything they're as sharp as needles and all they want is organization and that's what holmes is doing um uh, uh gregson arrives and says don't worry i've solved it i've even arrested the the murderer and it's arthur charpentier um and he uh um and as soon as he says that holmes gives a sigh of relief and you know relax into a smile because he knows he didn't solve the crime and um he says the Lestrade's going off looking for the secretary Strangerson, who was Dreber's name was in a book with 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 Dreber, and so he's out looking for him, and he's found this uh, um, a clue from a hat that has led them to the um, to a boarding house, the Charpentier's boarding establishment, and when he goes there, he discovers that Dreber had been. Uh, assaulting the daughter that lives there and that's where Drebber and Strangerson were staying and he was trying to get the girl to come out with him uh, to go away with him and her brother come in uh, discovered it and kind of kicked Drebber out physically and uh, so Gregson thinks well that must have been then the guy he went and then followed him and murdered him of course they had you know a fight earlier and then Drebber winds up dead. It must have been Charpentier who did it. Um, Strangerson, they discover, was a quiet, reserved man. Um, he was nice and Drebber was mean. And, um, uh, and then they left to go back to the, they left to go to the train to leave, but that was the last that they were seen uh, um, was when they left the house together. Um and uh, Holmes is not convinced, but, you know, but obviously Gregson is convinced, especially as the, the 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 son didn't come back for a while. So it must have been him that did it. And Drebber thinks that um, he because there was no mark or wound on the body that he must have uh, hit him in the stomach with a stick, um, <laughs> which killed him without leaving a mark. I mean, that's a real stretch. Um <laughs> right uh oh there's no mark in the body well he hit him in his stomach with a stick that's what did it i mean i guess it's possible but but you know poison poison is really not uncommon it's like the place i've never heard of the borgias yeah well 
Holmes like, great job being very sarcastic. You've done it. Well done. And then Lestrade comes in and he's like, you'll never guess. I went to see Strangerson and he's dead. Um, uh, he was murdered in his hotel room. Uh, and then we get the last chapter of the first part, chapter seven, light in the darkness. Um, and everybody's uh, shocked. And even Holmes, he says, Strangerson too, he muttered. The plot thickens like Holmes isn't quite Holmes didn't quite think that there was going to be another murder. It seems like he really thought that this was solved, like there was a murder who did this, but not somebody who was going to murder someone else. And mm -hmm. now he's discovered that there's another thread in the tangled scheme to pull out. Mm -hmm. Well. Um, Holmes. Uh, tells them uh, how was he killed uh, how was strangerson killed and uh, uh lestrade had gone tracked him down and he went to the room and there was blood coming out from under the door and he went in and he was stabbed to death um and the word uh raka again was written in letters of blood um Watson says there was something so methodical and so incomprehensible about the deeds of this unknown assassin that it imparted a fresh ghastliness to his crimes. My nerves, which were steady enough on the field of battle, tingled as I thought of it. Um, so Watson, again, kind of the, you know, he's the weaker of the two, in a sense, that can't quite handle all the stress of this. Um, someone saw a man descend the ladder outside of the hotel room. Um, and, uh, so, uh, and now they don't know who did it. It obviously couldn't have been Arthur Charpentier because he was in jail when this happened. So now they're all like, who's done it? Um, Holmes then gets a, um, uh, or they find out that there was no papers on the new murdered man's pocket and Strangerson's pocket, but a telegram from Cleveland about a month ago, containing the words, J.H. is in Europe. Um, and on the windowsill, a small chip ointment box, a little box containing a couple of pills. Holmes is like, you know, that's it. My case is complete. Now he's figured it out just by that. He's like, all right, figured it out. Here it is. Um, the last link, um, all the threads which have formed such a tangle. And Lestrade says, I have the pills. And Holmes says, can I see them? And then he, then we get this weird thing, right? This is weird. Um, <laughs> Holmes is like, isn't, isn't, uh, isn't the landlady's dog dying? <laughs> and wants you to put her, put him to sleep. And Watson's like, yeah, go get the dog. And they bring this poor dog up. Who they who they say has been dying anyway. Well, I mean, at least they didn't use Watson's bullpup that we yes. you know never see again, apparently. Really poor shape. And Holmes prepares one of the pills and feeds it to the dog, but like nothing happens. He's like, What? And he does the other pill, and that kills the dog instantly. So we've got dog death here. The unfortunate creature's tongue seemed hardly to be moistened in it when it gave a convulsive shiver in every limb. Um Sorry, it should have been a, a a warning there for, you know, dog death. But this dog was dying anyway. They didn't just like carelessly just kill any dog. This dog was ready to be put to sleep. So um, Holmes tells them that they failed at the beginning of the in inquiry to grasp the importance of the single real clue which was presented. Um, and But Holmes had figured it out right away that it's the fact that there was um, he says the strange details far from making the case more difficult have really had the effect of making it less so. And they say, can you name who did it? And, um, uh, Holmes says, uh, cause we, we have to arrest him right away. And Holmes is like, don't worry, there'll be no more murders. Um, and I'm going to lay hands on him very shortly. And at that moment, the, uh, the Wiggins uh, of the Baker Street Division here comes comes in and with with uh, with a insignificant and unsavory person. Oh no, that's Wiggins. He's the insignificant and unsavory person. And um, he says, "There's a, a cabbie here." And then 
home the, the, the cabman comes in and home says hey cabby can you help me uh with this you know box over here uh, help me with the buckle and the cabman cabman does and holmes claps the the uh uh handcuffs on him and says gentlemen let me introduce you to mr jefferson hope the murderer of enoch drebber and of joseph strangerson um he struggles tries to jump out the window they pull him in and you know they overpower him and Holmes says we have and then they're gonna take him in and Holmes says we have his cab it will serve to take him to Scotland Yard and now gentlemen he continued with a pleasant smile we have reached the end of our little mystery you are very welcome to put any questions that you like to me now and there is no danger that I will refuse to answer them you kind of promise that we will um get the, you know, so all the solutions will now come to us that Holmes will explain in part two. Well, and it's so great that um, the culprit is a cabbie because there have been cabs throughout this entire story. Um, you know, Hope and, and his victim came to Lauriston Gardens in a cab and Holmes remarks it's a cab um, and, and there's cabs everywhere. So it's it's just sort of it's one of those things that's dangled in front of you as a reader throughout the story, but somehow it doesn't cross your mind that it's the cabbie. Yeah. And this ties in with, you know, the 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 Sherlock Cumberbatch, you know, one, two. So um, oh yeah. I mean, in that one, the first five minutes is different people calling a cab, taking a cab, and then dying, and yet somehow. Very few people that I talked to actually figured out it was the cabbie. It's it's amazing. Well, we had to go long tonight. Um, sorry, but we had to go so long. But there's like all those little details, I think, were really important in the first mm-hmm. Sherlock Holmes story, the first half. It's, it's interesting, even though part two, is, I think, just as long because of, of how it, it, it structured part two with the trip over to America and, and all like that's kind of that'll be quicker to get through so Mm -hmm. that won't be uh that won't be as difficult so Mm -hmm. um and that's what we'll hear next week in part two the country of the saints yeah with i believe you are with curtis next week i am and uh sherlockians everyone thank you for joining us for episode one of sherlock mondays uh anastasia thank you so much thank you thank you again for having me co-host always always happy to be here coming up next and you'll return in in three weeks so we'll run Uh, i return i believe my next appearance is actually november 6th so i'm not on for a while unless i know it's not that long is it is it okay well i guess we're not i I think it is (laughs) we made the schedule i know i know you'll miss me oh i definitely will uh coming up next week we'll cover part two of a study in scarlet when curtis armstrong joins me as co-host and we'll learn of Jefferson Hope's adventure in the country of the saints. Thank you to the sponsor of Sherlock Mondays, Lisa Washington. We couldn't do these shows without the generous support of our patrons. Uh, You can support the Rosenbach through donation. Your support helps us create more programs like this and also care for our collections. You could also become a member. Membership gives you early access and discounts to programs and courses. You can find out more at our website, rosenbach.org. Again, let me remind you to subscribe to our channel, like these videos right now, go down, like it. Um, And if you're listening to the podcast, to please leave us a review. I think that's all we have for this week, everyone. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach Museum and Library, where the game is always a book and let me share the final credits thank you everyone good night good night